Hey everyone, we are right at 11, so we are going to go ahead and get started. This is our second webinar in the Be a Better Voter series for the 2022 midterms, and this time we are focused on single issue voters. So our presenters today are myself, I'm Misty Wilson Mertens, the Chair of Social Sciences, and your real presenter is Kimberly Cox, Associate Professor of Government. Kimberly, do you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. <laughs> All right. So to get us started, can you please just briefly explain what is political socialization? Yeah, so I promise this is a presentation on single issue voters and starting with this slide may be confusing, but to get to what single issue voters are and their potential impact on the elections, um, I wanted to cover a little bit of background and understanding how our beliefs and values are shaping voter choices. So political socialization is the first step. And it is the process by which people acquire beliefs and values and habits of thought and action related to the government, politics and society. So we're looking at beliefs and values that impact political behavior. And it's typically an informal learning process that everyone um, experiences throughout life due to interactions with parents, family, friends, neighbors, peers, colleagues, etc. But it's also very personal to everyone and we all experience um, what I'm going to get into in a little bit is these agents of socialization differently and therefore our lens of how we view what is most important politically is also very personal. So when you're talking about those agents of socialization, are they all equal? I don't think so. I think for each person it's it's going to be different. Some people are heavily influenced by their family um, in, in youth, and then that'll change as they kind of have their own experiences in life. Um, if you come from a, a religious household, for example, that, that re religion could impact you. Um, if you come from a house that is very politically active, that has an influence versus if you come from a family that does no politics, you know? So I, I think each agent, it, it, it again, it's very personal to the person and, and how they grew up and how what they were exposed to and what they experience. And um, to kind of dive in just a little bit deeper, not too much, but there's two types of political socialization. Um, the first is primary socialization. So this again is when a child learns the attitudes, values, and actions appropriate to individuals um, as members of a particular culture. So um, think about it in your home, your family, that would include your immediate family, like parents, siblings, grandparents, or those that kind of are around you the most. And, and again, this happens statistically when you're younger, and it will be statistically your strongest influence. It's also been known to be the most enduring influence, meaning it sticks with you as we grow older. Um, so think about, as an example, um, your parents, what they instilled in you from a very young age about politics and government, or, um, you know, if they didn't talk about government politics, did that impact you? you as a youth. Likely if your parents um, didn't participate, didn't talk about politics, current events, etc., you you likely will not as well as a youth because you lack that exposure. Now later as you go through life that could change. Um, but overall if you were active as at a younger age, probably your, your parents had an influence or those around you. And think about in this context um, how what they conveyed to you influenced uh, your belief and value system. And then the second one is secondary socialization. And um, this is a process of learning um, what is appropriate behavior as members within a smaller group within a larger society. So this is outside the home. This is not inside the home. And, and I, I, I say this is where we begin as individuals to navigate more independently the world. So peers, school, what we consume in media, religion, work, um, those are things that, that will have an impact in this secondary uh, tier level. And one of the things um, beyond family, if we're looking at secondary school is a really big factor. Um, and so, you know, in, in the news, there's been a lot about political activity within local school levels. And to me, it's not that surprising because when we look at political socialization, you can make that connection families first, then schools and peers next. So political scientists know this, people working in politics know this. And so the discussion being framed around schools and a, as an extension of family beliefs and values for many uh, makes a lot of sense to me. I, I don't I don't know if that makes sense, but it does to me. So um, and I'll kind of 
one last thing before I move on to give you a visual visualization. I always use this analogy of a bookshelf um, that holds our political values, identities and behaviors, and it's empty when we're born. So think of an empty bookshelf. And then during our childhood and adolescence, the shelves are filled slowly with stories that receive from these various agents of socialization and, and from our own experience as well. And as these bookshelves get full, we start to kind of form a more clear political identity. Um, and so if someone asks us what we think about an issue or candidate, we're going to pull from that bookshelf of information we've stored and to form new ideas as we get older. And as we have those outside experiences, we may have to switch out some of those books on the shelf to update or adjust our beliefs and values around politics. So socialization is not stagnant. It can change. Definitely not. And this picture gives you a broad view of some of the agents of socialization and again you can see it's it's varied and for each person it's going to be different and, and you know your experiences your your what's happened to you with your life in general where you grew up geographically sometimes you know are obviously is going to have an impact so I, I think it it is not stagnant um as is political parties are not stagnant either. And so the items represented um, here, um, there's a theory about socialization based on these agents where the thought is our sense of self is developed through this complex process of interactions with those around us and these experience and these agents. And these agents maybe don't always align. Like you might feel one thing at school and another thing from your family and those things are in competition. Yeah, and I think it's really complicated. I think, you know, we tend to, you know, when we're talking about politics, try to categorize things because that's human nature. We want to make things easy for our brain to kind of understand. But politics is hard. Um, you know, if you're looking at this from a political science standpoint and you're trying to study this, again, most of the studies for political science, if you're looking at polling data, et cetera, it's really difficult because the world is not a lab. And so, you know, we often look at polling on these then you wonder why can't the polls get this right why can't they predict which of these agents will be the best and it's because the world isn't a lab and it's really hard to predict they can try to eliminate as many errors as possible but that's that's about the best they can do so when we're in the real world how does this all function within a democracy yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, I kind of ask this question is, do we then use a sense of self in choosing who or what we vote for, if that makes sense? And um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, being able to participate and influence decision making, it, it's really an important part of our democracy. And so likely what happens is the issues that matter most to you or to me do impact whether we vote how we participate in elections and voting and who we actually vote for. So uh, these issues do impact our behavior and 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 do kind of push us to participate, not participate, vote, not vote, you know, um, how we vote, et cetera. So we are talking about, of course, single issue voters. Yes. So I think there's a tendency to conflate a single issue voter with maybe a very party loyal voter. And are those things the same or are they different? They're a little bit different. I mean, some people say, oh, if you're a party voter, you're a single issue voter, but not really. And I'll get into a, a clearer definition of single issue here in a second. But um, again, it's important to understand party loyalty to get the whole picture, I think, still. And party loyalty, why it's such a big factor when you're looking at polls and, and trying to predict um, how elections are going to fall is party loyalty statistically has been a much bigger factor in predicting election outcomes and how one will vote. So uh, what is party loyalty voting? Um, it's where one chooses to vote with a party because of um, one's family history or voting for that party um, in that party. So basically what they say with party loyalty voting, you will support a party regardless of that party's stance on a certain issue. Um, it is if there, there's a sense of belonging or being part of a team when it comes to party loyalty voting as well. Um, so there's really kind of this idea we sometimes see, um, especially with like w October surprises, is this big issue going to have an impact? And you'll see, you know, parties sticking with their candidate, even though there's been a big surprise. Why? That party loyalty is so, so strong. And just for our students, an October surprise is something that happens right before an election that can swing the election one way or another. And it's yeah. a pretty famous political quite a bit. <laughs> and, and we've already had, you know, a few here and there, but the polling looking at a lot of these part up. Uh, uh, October surprises that have happened to date, there's not been a lot of movement. Uh, the parties are digging in with their candidates and and sticking with their people. So 
you know, um, again, party loyalty is kind of the, the first factor. I always look at political socialization and party loyalty, and then we get to single issue voters. And so what are they? Um, overall, you're a single issue voter if you tend to align with a candidates or a vote or candidate or vote directly on issues in a singular way. So what I mean by that is there's two main categories of single issues that political scientists, you know, typically will focus on. The first one's the economy. Um, the, I always say the economy is king in political science when you're looking at predicting factors. And then there's social issue voters. So um, social issues vary, but they can include things like gun control, abortion, women's right, LGBTQ um, issues, uh, voting rights, democracy, and the health of democracy, healthcare, and climate change. Where the and I think crime. Did I mention that? That's those are the ones that have been trending across the board right now. And so the point is that though is that it, the issue you choose means it is the first and most important issue that will influence how you vote in a particular election if you're a single issue voter. And so hopefully that makes sense. in a particular election, like let's say in 2020, my thing was healthcare because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. We're now two years later, could I switch my single issue to gun control? That happens actually. Um, now there are some diehards who their issue is always, for example, um, climate and environment. That's their thing. They're going to vote every single time on that. But there's a lot of single issue voters who are more moderate or independent voters that, you know, because they do vote across party lines and now that is not the majority of people, but there are those kind of middle block voters that the parties are always kind of competing for. Um, and you see that right now with immigration and, and crime on the Republican side, abortion and climate change would be the ones on the Democratic side. That they're really kind of pushing those issues, um, trying to get those non-decided voters, if that makes sense. And I think, too, what we get with single issue voters, one of the things is, are they, the question is, are they informed voters or are they not informed voters, if that makes sense? And I think, yes, there's a group of single issue voters who maybe are not informed. They don't have as much information about parties and candidates, so they'll just go with an issue. Um, but there's also those who are informed voters and they may normally vote with a party, but there's an issue that's really driving them for that particular election. So um, what I just heard you say is that not all single issues are the same and some maybe are more um, salient than others. Is that the way to look at that? Yeah, it is. It, and I think that when we look at what is the most important issue, um, that's the salience. And salience is this idea. And with parties, you're looking for how can we make these issues important to voters to drive them to our side? Um, so if you're a single issue voter, that particular issue, whether it's the economy or immigration or gun control or abortion or whatever, that's going to be your most, if, if it's salient for you, the more salient it is for you, I should say, the more that you will vote based on that issue. Um, so it's the thing that's going to drive you. You're like, I, you know, I normally vote this way, but this issue, this is the thing that's driving my vote. It's the most salient. I care the most about it. So that's going to play into single issue voting a lot. So I know um, when we talk about single issue voters, we almost always look at that as a negative. Is there you, an, any advantage to being a single issue voter? <laughs> yeah, I had to reach for this, I'll be honest, but I, I guess it's easier. Um, so, you know, you, some would say, you know, there is an advantage to it. I, I'm I'm on the fence with this, but on issue voting, you could identify your top non-negotiable issue, find that party or candidate that aligns with you on that issue, and there's your vote. Easy, done. Um, if you're looking at party loyalty, you could do the same thing. Um, it's easier because you can look at the party platform, see what's the best fit for you, and then just vote for that party's candidates up and down the ballot. And the problem is with so much information out there and a lot of confusion over elections, candidates, voting, many feel this is an easier way or route to go. To go is just to, you know, you know, pick that issue that's driving you, find the candidate or the party that's working for you on that and, and, and vote for them. And voters often seem overwhelmed and they don't know where to look for information, who to trust is trust is a big one right now. And so picking a party or an issue sometimes will take the guesswork out of voting. It'll help people. OK, are there disadvantages? Yeah, um, I, this is the one I agree with more. I'll be honest. Um, so there are disadvantages. To one party or issue always is very, in my opinion, limiting yourself and may not allow your ideas to evolve or be tested. And what I mean by that, you could get stuck voting for one party or issue 
only to find out later down the road um, that they've changed when you weren't looking. Um, so parties and platforms do evolve. They're not stagnant. Um, and you've seen candidates even evolve over time. They'll, they'll have said one thing like five years ago, and now they're on a different you know page, it seems like. So, um, you know, an example in the shifting of Democrats in Texas from conservative to liberal is another one I look at from a Texas government perspective. If you were for 100 years a Democrat, you know, voting in Texas, that party platform is a lot different than the Democratic Party platform now. So um, you kind of need to be um, aware of what the party's platforms are, um, where the candidates stand on those issues. And if you're looking at interest groups, what are their priorities that they're that they're, you know, if they're they're talking about a big broad topic like climate change, you know, what are their focus? Is that the focus you want them to be pushing for? So again, I think you might limit yourself by sticking with one party or issue and not doing at least periodic research to make sure they still align with your beliefs and values. And I think that's the real danger. Yeah, it strikes me that another problem could be that there's no way for you to communicate to the person you're voting for that I'm voting for you based solely on this one issue. Yeah, I think that, you know, it, there's not a lot of communication between candidates and parties and voters right now. I mean, you, you do hear you've got a, a a small in my and again, chime in if anybody wants to, but a small amount of people really vocal and then a lot of people not being vocal. So it, it does make it difficult for, I think, politicians and parties to know what's going to hit with a lot of the voters in America. And, you know, they know what their base thinks, but it's that middle voting block. They kind of can look at all, again, all these predictors and, you know, the ideas behind political socialization and kind of get an idea of what will drive them, but it does get hard. So, you know, that's, that's kind of my take on that. So what are our suggestions to students up to this point? We haven't introduced so, actual politics yet, but <laughs> suggestions no. on just being a single issue voter. My suggestion is to combat the negative, on combating those negatives is to find a more middle ground approach and to be open to looking at all sides. Um, so identify the issues that are most important to you and really dig in and ask why they are important and think about how you were socialized. Think about political socialization. Why do you think that? Where did you get that? And how does it impact you as a voter? Are these issues also negotiable or non-negotiable? Are they, are they things that, you know, it really kind of depends? Are they, nope, this is how I feel and this is how I'm voting, done. Research the party and platforms to see where they stand on your top issues um, as well to get uh, as well as all the items to get a very more, a more well rounded picture and get a sample ballot, get a sample ballot and research those candidates running and what their stance is on the issues that are most important to you. And I think the key is to be open to reevaluating where you stand and where these parties stand on a regular basis, because remember, we ourselves as individuals and the parties are not stagnant. We are ever evolving. So checking in with yourself and the parties and the candidates can be beneficial to keeping you up to date. So I know that one thing that political scientists look for to determine salience and to determine how influential or important an issue is, is change over time. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of this, of course, is by outside factors, but our single issues that drive us do change, right? Yeah, they do. And so I, I pulled basically this slide. It's at midterm 2018 to now, at least where the polling was at June of 2022. And I, I throw in June because things change so fast. But, um, you know, how we translate all of this into the impact of single issue voters over time is is really important to look at. So um, this poll again is from June. Um, things can change close to an election. I want to throw that in there one more time. But as of June 2022, the economy was the most important issue. And you'll notice that as a shift from 2018 where healthcare ranked highest. And so I had to do a lot of digging on this one. Why would inflation be such a big issue for voters in general? Um, if you look at inflation um, on this graph, um, in 2018, I, I pulled what the dollar was worth. So in 2018, the dollar would be worth the equivalent to a dollar 18 in 2020. 22. So this means that today's prices are 1.18 times higher than the average prices in 2018. And this is according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, Consumer Price Index. So, you know, if you're looking at a dollar and why inflation is, is important, today it only buys you 
about 84.7% of what it could buy you back in 2018. And everybody's feeling the pinch of that. Um, so that's that's why. Um, on healthcare in 2018, the poll showed 70% um, of both Democrats and Republicans felt healthcare system needed an overhaul. And there was a big, there was a lot of reporting at that time. Um, and what we were seeing in 2018 was that healthcare cost was hitting a 20 year high. Um, and before um, that, you know, it, I don't know. It just it was interesting to kind of look at those numbers and see. So there's a lot of factors that impact single issue voters. If in 2018 your your issue was healthcare, it was probably because we we're at a 20 year high, you know, on healthcare costs. And people are like, wow, this is way too expensive. If we're looking at inflation now, we're looking at, wow, my dollar doesn't buy me as much. That that issue could be a big factor for you. Um, well, luckily for those 2018 voters, there wasn't a major global pandemic that came along no. that really tested their resolve to care about yeah. healthcare. And, and I, I picked a, and the next slide is a 2020 presidential year where we still have pandemic stuff and you'll see the impact of that for sure. But um, the one on here that, you know, the economy didn't really surprise me as much why um, abortion, Dobbs decision, you know, that's probably why healthcare. maybe we're getting used to those high costs and with COVID fatigue. Um, I think immigration now versus in June is a lot higher um, than it shows on this graph. So, you know, things again, things change. And then so, on this, oh, go ahead. So 2018 and 2022, those are midterm election years. So that means the people that are paying attention now are usually pretty well informed. But 2020 is a presidential election year. So that usually means even lower information voters tend to get involved, right? Yeah. And I mean, it, this one, it was really interesting to look at because healthcare on this one, when I dug into the data on it, it had to do with COVID fear and fatigue. So there was the fear over masking uh, longer, um, social distancing. There was some there were some statistics on, you know, not being able to go back to work or school. Um, so I think that played into it. And the economy is number five on that list, which was surprising to me um, that econ that healthcare was number one and the economy was down at the bottom. Um, you know, because usually economy is king. So this was this was a weird poll for me to look at, I'll be honest, um, compared to other ones in presidential election years. Um, but it was, you know, it was the importance of issues. It was looking at salience again, too. So um, maybe if I'd pulled a poll for this, this um, talk that was more just generic in nature versus on salience, it would have played out a little bit different. I, I think economy would have been more at the top, but it was interesting to see the salience issue again. Because you just can't care about everything all at once, right? God, no. Oh, well, I guess, no. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I, just, I just think it's really hard. I don't know, but. No, so are we out voters. of the weird times now? Are we back to normal? No, I don't think so, but. <laughs> Really don't. Now, I think I think this year is going to be um, an interesting year. We have a really close race, um, both nationally. I think more so nationally than at the Texas level, um, but a lot of states are close. So it's going to be an interesting outcome. Um, and this is the national view for 2022. We'll look at the local view in a second. But what we want for Congress at the national level may be different from, say, the governor of our state. So I do think we have to distinguish between issues that are salient on a national level versus a state level. Um, so in the Politico Harvard poll um, shown on the left side, Registered voters were asked to describe how important each of 19 issues were um, in the congressional election, and they also did look at salience again, how important these issues were to everyone, how passionate they were, um, were they concerned, very concerned, etc. And the table shows the top issues identified by registered voters to be inflation, the economy and jobs, gun policies, and abortion. And this is across the board. So um, this is similar to the findings of a Gallup poll that I looked at as well, um, which showed the top three voting issues are the economy, gun policy, and abortion. So um, the polls on the slide also were done in the summer, again, because it takes time for polling to be done and for the results to get out. So again, as we approach the election, all this could shift, which is always fun to try to predict. Got it. So when and, you're talking about the economy, that is such a broad term. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's and, easy to get lost in that. Yeah. And, and it was interesting because there was a lot on inflation um, 
as the main predictor on economy, and I'm not an economist. So I want to put that out there right now, but it, it was interesting to see the overall 30% identified um, inflation as their top issue, but that's down seven points from the last time the question was asked in July. Um, that was following the abortion, 22% uh, I have up there, which was up four points. Gas prices going down, maybe, if, from what I could find, was the driver of that, but with the OPEC decision, what, just a few days ago, and if gas prices go back up, that could shift again as well. Um, I don't know. I think with inflation being up, I don't see the economy and inflation dropping much. Um, other predictors that were economic in nature were the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which I, I found nobody really cared about. I'll be honest, nobody was looking at it that much. Student loan forgiveness was interesting. Um, there was, when that first came out, a lot of positive polling across parties on that, to be honest, it, and I was surprised. I think it's because a lot of people, whether you're Democrat, Republican, or in between, um, have student debt. Um, so that, that was one of the things that was really interesting. Um, I was trying to think of another one. Sorry. Um, I don't know. It, 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 I think that the economy, in my prediction, will be the biggest factor. Um, you might have other issues like student loan forgiveness or abortion, which we'll talk about here in a second, but I don't know if those are going to outrun the numbers on the economy. I could be 100% wrong on that, though. But historically, the economy is sort of our measuring stick for how an election yeah. is going to go. So that makes sense to me. I put this, um, I'll mention this for a move on real quick. So I forgot about the global warming one here. That has to do with climate change. Um, we saw the hurricane and the, the, the damage that it did in Florida. And it looked like more people were equating um, climate change with, with economic issues. Um, you know, getting insurance for flood and hurricane and wind damage is going to be outrageously expensive at some point for a lot of these states. Um, you know, just just the cost of of living in a world that's going to have these storms and fires and all this um, seems to be more matching or, or going over to an economic issue, which was an inter interesting new shift that I hadn't seen before. And all then right, so um, this, this issue, one. <laughs> this one. Um, so why are some of the polls showing a slip on the issue uh, here? Um, it, first, we saw this huge upswing um, on the issue of abortion, um, and it corresponded with the Dobbs decision, which came out June 24th, I believe, and that was the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Um, the polling showed that Democrats, independents, and some Republicans were very energized around this issue, in particular right after the decision. We're still seeing a trend up. In particular, for the Democrats, it's a very salient issue. And when I say that in this, they're, they're really jazzed and energized about the topic enough to try to, you see a lot more get off the vote by Democrats and them really pushing this issue. Um, we've seen record numbers in some states of youth and women voters registering for the first time, which may be an indicator. And then the Kansas election um, that we had um, not too long ago was a good example where this happened. So on that particular Particular, um, ballot, they were looking to overturn a state constitutional provision that would allow for abortion and everybody, the, the, the basically the amendment that was put forth would, would basically say that they could limit abortion more in Kansas and voters said no, overwhelmingly, we want to keep this in our constitution. Um, so abortion in the past it was really interesting, did the same thing for pro-life voters. Um, it got them really enthused as Republican voters on the pro-life side. The question moving forward is, will Dobbs do the same thing for Democrats? So this is a good example of an issue that may be top of list for some voters. It could be their non-negotiable. Um, and my guess is if it is a non-negotiable, it is more so for Democrats looking at the polling um, than Republicans and driving people to the polls. So um, it was really interesting. The the One of the graphs on this slide was also saying that um, Democrats polled that they were uh, more likely to be active in helping other voters and contacting their representative, giving money. Um, so if we isolate Texas voters from national voters, though, 49% of those polled felt that they should be less restrictive on abortion and 20% said stricter. So 21% said leave it 
as is and 10 percent had zero opinion whatsoever so um i i don't know in texas how it'll play out it'll be really interesting to see though so explain what's happening here this looks like just from my naked eye to show us movement on certain issues that's basically it so my, my look at this one was where have we seen further gains and losses on some of these issues. So abortion, biggest gain, especially for Democrats, obviously, after the Dobbs decision. And other gains were in gun policy, Supreme Court appointments. I think that had a lot to do with some of the, the more controversial decisions uh, or what are perceived as controversial decisions coming down. And COVID, uh, for example, that was way down. And people are just done with COVID, I think. So they're like, I don't care, I'm done. <laughs> um, and But the one thing this graph does not really show is the economy. And I still think that's the biggest driver. So we'll have to wait and see. But it was interesting to kind of look at these on a full page. So if I was advising a Democratic candidate, can we go back just one second? Um, I would tell my candidate, you need to be talking about abortion. You need to talk about gun policy. You need to talk about Supreme Court. You need to stay away from foreign policy. Is yeah. That, okay. And if I was advising a Republican, I would say you need to talk about foreign policy. You need to talk about violent crimes. Mm -hmm. And those crimes, are your winning issues. Immigration. Mm -hmm. Energy policy was the one weird one here in Texas because of the grid issues. So um, this is a national one. But, you know, um, yeah, the energy policy was one of those weird ones where here in Texas it, it may be more trending um, because of Snowmageddon, you know, that we had. Y'all remember Snowmageddon? So. <laughs> but this would help explain why I'm hearing one message from one party and a different message from a different party, because it's all about creating that enthusiasm among those issue voters. Yeah, and it'll vary from state to state, too, which is on this this next slide. So, you know, Kansas already kind of mentioned this one. Um, the value them both ballot measure was the one that was blocked by voters in Kansas. So previously, again, Kansas State Supreme Court said the state constitution allowed the right to an abortion and the ballot measure sought to add language that would allow to limit. Um, so that was a really big deal in Kansas. Um, Sometimes elections are also about candidates in Pennsylvania. Um, the economy and abortion are, are the top issues, at least, you know, at the time of this poll that I have uh, posted. And um, but candidates seem to be the real driver. Um, Fetterman is outperforming Dr. Oz. And um, if you've watched any politics, you've seen these guys on TV um, and they're competing for one of those um, important Senate seats where the you know, Democrats are hoping to hold the Senate and the Republicans are hoping to take it. Um, pollsters think the Pennsylvania race is about really Fetterman winning because Oz is so inexperienced and he's been such an ineffective candidate. Um, then you have Palin uh, over on the from Alaska. That was really interesting. Um, voters, they just seem to be really tired of her. It was really interesting. They just were like, I'm done with her. Um, move on. And then. I don't have any pictures of these, but we see other races like in Arizona, the Kelly Masters, I think will be um, interesting to watch. Um, Ohio, I think J.D. Vance has got the edge, but Tim Ryan's been fighting really hard as a Democrat against him. J.D. Vance is kind of a controversial. Um, there was some recent reporting out um, lately on that race. Georgia, I think everybody's probably heard about Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnack. Um, you know, so the point is sometimes it's issues. Um, sometimes it's up to, you know, which candidate is really driving things. Um, but again, I'm going to go back to party loyalty is going to be the big one. And all of those races you just mentioned, they're all going to be close. Yes. Yeah. They're the ones to watch for the Senate in particular. I mean, that's that's those candidates I mentioned are the Senate ones. But um, and that right now, 538 is saying that the Democrats have a slight edge to hold the Senate and that Republicans have a slight edge to take the House. So everything is really, really close on the national um, side of things. But on Texas, it's a little bit different. We always are. So what's happening in Texas? So I'm not going to go through all these, but I wanted I was looking at polling. I wanted to pull um, the big issues that that are on, on the different polls. So economy and abortion were the ones I saw the most on after that. And these are in no particular order after that. But immigration and crime, the power grid was really a big deal. Um, you know, abortion, obviously, yeah, we mentioned that one. So um, but it, I don't know. It was um, 
it was interesting to look at like the immigration one and busing migrants and, and gun violence. And there were some statistics on, you know, the support for those that was really surprising to me. So um, 57% of Texans, for example, um, say that elected officials have done too little to prevent mass shootings in Texas. Now it's a big number, but still most people will vote for Abbott who's been in control of Texas while the gun violence numbers have been in place. So, you know, I, I don't know where, again, I think party loyalty is really driving that um, direction of the state. 52% of voters say Texas is on the wrong track, down from a record high at 59% yet Republicans will probably win again. So, you know, the polling numbers on these issues in Texas are all over the map, and it looks like there's some dissatisfaction with the way things have gone, but yet the same party that's in control will probably win. So, so Professor Hannah put a comment in our chat, and I think it kind of speaks to what you were just saying. It says, don't single inter voter, single issue voters end up voting against their own self-interest. If you're voting on a single issue instead of things that affect you day to day, is it possible that you could vote for a candidate who doesn't match the rest of like maybe your economic point of view? Yeah. I mean, if you if you're really passionate about gun issues or abortion, you know, pick one on the other side, you know, is that, you know, is that really impacting things versus I don't know, I, it, it's really hard. But yeah, I agree. I think that um, I, I think that their single issue may be throwing them off. And that's where I say looking at all the issues, looking at the party platforms, looking at the candidates, you know, doing that research really matters because single issue voting can be easier, but I don't know if it's always giving you the effectiveness of your vote that you really, your intent, you're intending, if that makes sense. And I know I'm probably not explaining that well, but. So easier does not equal better. Exactly. All right. So what's happening in our governor's race since we don't have a Senate seat up right now? Yeah, so the governor's race I picked is the big one, and I'm not going to read all these to you, but there's four issues um, where Texans are trusting Abbott to do a better job, and then there were two for um, Beto O'Rourke where they had more trust um, for Beto O'Rourke. It was interesting just to look at these because they really do map or match sort of um, the the national statistics. Um, you can see here on the, the spread, the percentage of people who um, – look like they're voting for Greg Abbott versus Beto O'Rourke. And the polls have been all over the place, but the one I looked at today had Abbott up plus eight. So um, obviously, I don't know if it means that they just trust him more overall um, on all the issues or if it's a party loyalty thing. I think in Texas, party loyalty is a big deal. Um, I'll just be honest. Um, so out of the 11 issues poll, four stood out immigration, border security, economy, um, abortion, and gun violence. So um, you know, that's just kind of a look really quick at the Texas vote governor's race. So what are our issues in Texas that we care about? Because I know we're a little different than other states, right? Yeah. So again, we got to look at not only who you will vote for and trust, but salience. And so this was more about um, that. So what is most important to Texans and immigration was really high on the list, economy and then abortion. And the graph on the right, again, looks at trust on issues by candidate. Um, the one that I was surprised about, if you look at the gun violence one, look at Beto O'Rourke and Abbott, they're even. So we mm -hmm. are, as a state, really split on that one. Um, abortion, that didn't surprise me too much. Um, education was almost neck and neck though. Um, so it's really kind of interesting to look at that, that on a lot of these issues, they're fairly close. I mean, except for immigration and economy. And again, economy is one of the bigger drivers. So that's going to have something uh, that um, stands out to me there is there's a pretty high percentage of no opinion or uninformed yet voters. Yeah. And those may be people who might be single issue voters at some point. Um, either they don't have information, they don't care. Maybe they just don't care about politics and voting. That's, you know, and that's, that's fine. But um, I'm not quite sure there why that number is so high. Because um, really, it's not even that they're still deciding, it seems like from the graphing or the polling, but they just don't know and don't really care. Um, maybe they're just tired of politics. So <laughs> um, well, and we should say that if you're gray, like in gun violence, you're not necessarily gray in education. Yeah. So these are not the same people in each one of these lines. Exactly. Maybe it's, you know, and, and maybe they're saying that I don't know about education, but boy, the economy is my thing, you know. So mm -hmm. um, again, it's 
it's with single issue voting, it's really, really difficult. There was um, some really detailed polling I looked at that looked at the parties and since the Reagan era and how it's there's supposedly from the the study that was done that I looked at there is less individual single issue voters out there to grab from everybody's kind of moved into their team so to speak everybody's been sorted into democrat and republican or conservative and liberal on, on a more team party loyalty basis so those those middle of the road voters those single issue voters you've really got to push the issue if your issue you know your voters that are um potentially going to be Republican or going to be voting on immigration, crime, sell that. You know, if you are on the Democratic side, you know, it's climate change and abortion. You're going to have to sell that because you're going to have to make that really salient for those voters who are the don't know, no opinion category to even get them out to vote for you, I think. And well, and with our elections so close, it's going to end up being those people that decide the election. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, the thing with close elections, which this midterm across the board, I think, and even more, especially on the national level, there's going to be a lot of close races. Those issues may matter. They'll push someone to vote one way or the other. So I think, you know, normally with the predictive being that people are sorted into their categories, party is going to be the driver of that. And for most of those people, party is the driver. But there's those few undecideds in a close race that will throw an election one way or the other, especially that Senate, those Senate races that we were mentioning. Um, I think those are gonna be the fun ones to watch. And then kind of- Speaking of fun. (laughs) Wrapping this up, this was a new site that I found recently and was interesting. It's Texas 2036. And they are looking at um, doing polling in Texas in a nonpartisan way. We'll see if they can do it. Um, And trying to really gauge where voters are in Texas or where people, citizens are, what they want to see, and then offering up solutions in a nonpartisan way. So um, I just wanted to put this site out there and I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. This was um, looking at the data on the issues, what Texas voters are saying. These were the the polling uh, questions and numbers. So you can see education, workforce, widespread widespread support 87 percent granular reading and math tests to provide apples to apples comparisons um etc uh, justice and safety while 68 percent of texas voters said they trust local law enforcement 83 uh, percent of the participants shared that their confidence in law enforcement would increase if lawmakers made it harder to rehire officers who were previously fired for poor conduct so it gets into more details their polling was interesting it was very detailed versus kind of this generic polling that we get and i i like the idea of this so i'm really curious where this is going to go and if they'll be able to help kind of let policymakers know hey these are the things that people really think about education and the workforce or justice and safety so it was it was kind of a fun thing to look at and i have one more slide on that this is their website and on um, the dive into the data, the first like topic, they had a ton of talk- topics you could choose from on that pull down list. And on select the group, I just picked the total for this one, but it's on gender, on party, on age, on race. You can you can filter by different categories of people. Um, and same thing with the, this was the a poll they did on the state of Texas has a 27 billion general revenue budget surplus. And what did they want to see or what did the people they polled want to see uh, that spending done on? And you can see, um, you know, there's public education, the electricity grid, property tax reduction. And these all make sense if you live in Texas. So, um, again, I really hope that this will be um, that they can do this. Um, and I have no affiliation with these people, by the way, but I just um, I, I found it really interesting that they were being this detailed. Um, and if you are curious, um, I recommend going to look at the site for fun. You know. Fun for us. Yeah, fun for us, for sure. <laughs> and then, you know, does it match what people are searching online? Does all this polling I've been talking about on issues match what people are looking at and so just for fun I did the Google Trends and so you can see education look at the I mean it's just it looks like the all over the place (laughs) Um, and then crime you know everything else is fairly steady crime went up Um, and I think if you think about all the ad if you've seen any ads or heard any of the ads about crime and safety um it's been played up a lot lately like you know crime safety vote for us um 
you know, it, it was just really interesting. And this is a 30 day window on that. Um, so it, I, I guess the intake on this is sort of education, crime and taxes are the highest. Uh, but I was really look at abortion and inflation on the bottom line. I was like, those those really people weren't searching for those. Maybe it's because they already have an opinion. Maybe maybe these up here, uh, the three top ones, um, maybe there's more questions about how do I want to vote based on, you know, crime, education and taxes, whereas abortion and inflation, maybe people have made up their mind. Maybe that's why I that's not got also, as much movement. So, um, if we would have done the same Google trend in June. Abortion would be up there at the top because that's when the Dobbs decision was reached, right? Exactly. We, I think we so. tend to have very short political memories. Yeah. 30 um, days or less. And I wonder this this little spike here on inflation, you know, I couldn't figure out what was going on September, what, 11th or 12th. Um, I was trying to rack my brain. I was kind of trying to do some searches, but I was like, why did that spike on September, you know, right after September 10th on inflation? Don't I, I don't know. It was really interesting to kind of look at those trends. So that's a fun way to kind of look at what issues are trending for people as well. So nationwide, what are we looking at? Yeah, so this is kind of lastly to sum all this up. I, I want to mention how, you know, tight the generic national ballot polling is between the parties. Um, I think it's less of a tight race here in Texas. I think the Republicans have a, an, an edge over Democrats, um, but it's still closer even in Texas than we've seen it in a while. Uh, you, the talk that you did that were maroon, I think mm -hmm. holds true in all the polling I looked at. So even though Republicans are favored, they're going to have to work harder um, at this point. They have to work harder to get, they used to be able to, what I say, put it on cruise control and they'd still win. I don't know in some of these Texas races that that's the same anymore. I think they're having to work harder, spend a little more mm -hmm. money, so to speak. Um, and, and then the big question I have too to, on this particular graph that's showing is, will there be any more big surprises between now and November 8th that'll change anything? My guess is from looking at polling, not much unless it's major. Um, so if I guess we have something major, I don't know what would throw it at this point. I, you know, I was listening to a, a podcast uh, that 538 was doing um, this morning. And one of the things that they scared the heck out of me was like, oh, if we go to war with Ukraine and with, with Russia and nuclear war. And I thought, oh, God, you know, <laughs> so but their whole point, because they were talking about issues, was that it's going to have to be something big. And so we think mm -hmm. this is where it's going to stand. So for our students that want to have some takeaways here. Okay, so where does this leave us all? Um, uh, on uh, issues, um, you know, issues plural matter. It, and I say issues plural is what I'm saying. There more than one matter to voters, but will one single issue drive someone to vote in a particular way? And I think that's really hard to measure. Um, most years, the answer is no, unless you're talking about the economy. The economy is a huge single issue driver for a lot of voters. Party affiliation and loyalty seem to matter much more in predicting outcomes than single issue historically. So I will say this is, however, if an issue is salient enough, it can push more voters to the polls. And in a close election, that could be a deciding factor in some of those um, elections. I think it's why you see Republicans playing to the economy and immigration right now, because those are the salient issues for them and Democrats playing up. And on the economic side, their economic achievements to date, you know, abortion, climate change, they're going to play to there. So each party wants to motivate those single issue voters that do exist to vote for them. And hopefully that helps their chances of winning. So, you know, why is an issue salient? You know, that's another takeaway. Think back to political socialization and our own core beliefs and values. What drives us as voters? Is it one particular thing we're voting or is it a multitude. Um, so, you know, we have some examples of elections where, you know, pollsters would say voting on single issues made an impact. And the ones that I could find were 2010, it was anchored towards Obamacare. People were mm -hmm. mad about it. 2018, suburban women voters, you saw a big shift there. Um, it's, they said it's because of Trump and some of the comments on women. We had a big women's march, you know, when Trump was elected. But um, those are, it was really hard to find any, any single issue that, you know, election where it was clear that that was a single issue that pushed things. So I, I don't know. I, I don't think there's any single issue I've mentioned so far that will outperform the economy as an issue. Um, 
And I fin- I'll kind of finish with this. I think it's going to be on the national level, a really close race. And so I think some issues may play a part in national race, the national on the national level, if we look at overall in the U S but I think here in Texas, I'm, I'm just not sure. I think, I think that Republicans are, have the edge. Um, I, I don't see any tightening up on single issues of having a, a huge impact. Um, so I think it's going to, you know, if we're looking at single issues, I think it, matter state to state and race to race so um and and i don't know what everybody else thinks you know what's your top issue um is there anything salient that would push you and you don't have to tell me but you know thinking about this is there a salient issue or non-negotiable for you that would push you over the edge and i i'm talking to a lot of different people most people say it's not one issue it's it's a picture a big big broad Mm -hmm. picture so that's kind of where i leave that one So as of today, right now, we are less than 30 days away from our midterm elections. Yesterday was the last day possible to register to vote. And then early voting is going to start here in about, what, a week and a half, two weeks? Yes. And early voting is easier, so... I highly recommend (laughs) early voting. It's faster. You get in and and out so much faster. And I should have put it... And I had, don't have it pulled up, but I know um, aren't I think it's the early voting. Um, I'll be online if anybody has questions. Um, you know, I, I think last year I got it, like where's how do I locate my polling location? You know, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> definitely won't tell you anybody how to vote, but if you want to know just you know how to find my polling location, how do I get a sample ballot, that kind of generic stuff. Um, I believe it's I think it's the first day of early voting. It I'll is. Have to, okay, mm-hmm. sorry, I should have put that up. <laughs> It's the first day of early voting, and it's all about logistics. So yes. Not how to vote for a candidate per se, but like, how do I get myself to the location? <laughs> yeah. What do I need to bring with me? Yeah. Who? And I had a student. It's like, you know, I want to go vote, but I don't know who's on the ballot. And I was like, okay, here's how you get a sample ballot. You know, so they could go mm-hmm. look up their own stuff. But yeah, so I'll be in line. I believe it's at eleven o'clock. We'll put. We'll send out information on that. But. And if you don't early vote, then the last day to vote is on actual election day. Yeah, so the midterm election day is November 8th. Um, so if you don't vote early voting, which again, I highly recommend it's easier, then your last day to vote is November 8th for the midterm. And I'll just put a plug in here because as we've talked about single issue voting, you know, if you go go look at the party platforms, you know, go look at the candidates, get a sample ballot um, and do some research because again, I think a lot of people think you know they'll 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 talk about politics in very broad terms, but when you start digging into the issues and the candidates and the party platforms, it's really interesting. And I think you can get a better picture of who who you really would best fit you and and your belief and value system in politics. So, and just a tad to that, you may not agree with one hundred percent of anybody's policies. You probably won't. No, because of political socialization. And we'll go back mm-hmm. right to the beginning. Everybody grew up differently. Everybody's influences are different. So um, it's it's unrealistic to think that we'd all think the same based on how we grew up and live and, you know, what we're exposed to. Um, and also it'd be a really boring world if we were all robots and thought the same. So I like the debate. All right. We have two webinars left. One is going to be on Twitter politics or just online politics in general. And that's going to be with Professor Davis Hanna. And then we are going to have our election recap, kind of making sense of what issues were important, what drove people to the polls, and why they voted the way they did on November 16th. And then the reason that all of you are here, how to get credit for this class or this webinar. So I just put the credit link in the chat. Go fill that out. Um, Your professors will be entering that in usually towards the end of the semester. Uh, eight week classes in this week. So you should see that popping up soon for your 16 week classes. It'll probably be closer to December, but you will see that posted. And then that's how you get credit. If you have a question specific for one of your instructors, make sure you ask that to instructor. Um, But I do see somebody's hand up. So if you just want to type your question in the chat, we can answer that from there. And thank you guys for coming today. Yeah, thank you.